All right, we're going to start in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you would turn there, please. And I'm going to try and finish the lesson that I began before I went out of town. If you recall, I was talking in the first hour a couple weeks ago about the day of the Lord. And so I want to follow up on that. Now, this is just an overview because if we were to consider every detail that the Bible has to say about the day of the Lord, it would take a very lengthy series of lessons because the Bible has much to say about it. It's the most anticipated day on God's calendar. And uh, I remind you that the Bible uses the word day in more than one way. Um, it could certainly be used in the literal 24-hour period uh, sense of the word as we commonly use it, but it also can be used to refer to a prolonged period. And the context will determine how it's being used. We mentioned in Genesis 1, those days are literal days because it says the evening and the morning, and it says the first day, the second day. When those type of terms are used, it's specifying, it's obvious it's a literal day. But uh, in this present age, we're in the day of salvation, and it's gone on now almost 2,000 years. There's coming a day of wrath and the day of the Lord, and you study these different kinds of days. The Bible mentions the day of visitation. There's different ones you could study where you could see it's more than just one literal day. Uh, so we saw that the day of the Lord is used both ways in prophecy. Uh, in particular, the day of the Lord is the literal, the literal day Christ returns to the earth. Okay, The day of His coming. But we saw that the day of the Lord is also over a thousand years long because it includes the final battle with Satan and the renovation of the heavens and earth by fire after the kingdom age, after the thousand year reign of Christ. And so the day of the Lord... Uh, it, there's a lot to say about it. And, I mean, there's a lot to study. It just really, I, I think you'd be amazed if you took the time to look up just the, the references to the day of the Lord. But then also there's passages that say that day and it's talking about the day of the Lord. And I don't know how many times it's mentioned, but it's quite a bit. And, it, and it'd be a great study to do and get all the details on it. Uh, so, again, the day of the Lord is the day Christ returns in power and glory to reign on the earth, but it includes what leads up to it and what flows out of it. And so that explains the seeming contradiction between passages that describe the day of the Lord as a time of great destruction and darkness and gloominess and so forth, and other passages that describe it as a time of great blessing and light. Uh, the evening and the morning. First the evening, then the morning. So there is a darkness period about the day of the Lord, but it's followed by a light period. When Christ returns, He is called the Son of Righteousness, S-U-N, <laughs> with healings in His wings, his, the light rays, the brightness of His glory. And that same brightness will destroy the wicked and be a blessing to the righteous. And so uh, the psalm, I forget the reference now, I think it might be 37, but it says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. What is it? She, my wife's shaking her head. No, that's not the right. <laughs> you find it for me, let me know what it is. See, I, I, I remember a lot of verses, but sometimes I forget their address. And that's a... Uh, for So, uh, well, but thankfully I have a wife that sits on the near front row. Nobody sits on the front row. The second row, ready to, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, where is it? <laughs> Psalm 34, is it 34? You'll Go twice. <laughs> it's in there, I promise you that, it's in there. So, a controversial question, and this is what we were talking about last time, among dispensationalists, is whether the day of the Lord includes the 70th week at Daniel. We're talking about that final seven years leading up to the second coming of Christ. And I showed you some reasons why I believe that it does. And we left off talking about how the day of the Lord is likened to a woman travailing in childbirth. 1 Thessalonians 5.1 But of the times and the seasons. And, that, and that's got to do with prophecy. Now you'll notice, but, that's in contrast. In chapter 4 verse 13 to 18 he's talking about our blessed hope. 
He's talking about the coming of the Lord for the church, the body of Christ. What a, what a great comfort that is. In fact, that's how the passage ended. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And he was talking about we, we. He's talking about, am I French? <laughs> but he was talking about, you'll, say, you'll notice how he talks about our hope. It's we, the body of Christ. But then you come to chapter 5 and there's a contrast. But of the times and the seasons. Now, the times and the seasons are times and seasons in prophecy. You got it yet? Psalm 30. Psalm 30. I was in the 30s. I knew it was in the 30s. You can write that down and look at it later. Uh, weeping endures for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Psalm 30, verse 5. So the times and the seasons like Daniel 2.21 and Acts 1.7, times and seasons, seasons of prophecy. Okay, But the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. And there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 5, he said, Remember you not that when I was with you I told you these things? And he's talking about the 70th week of Daniel. He had already instructed them on this. And uh, they knew, they should have known it wasn't about them. And he explained these matters. And we'll probably look at 2 Thessalonians 2 a little bit later. But also, he doesn't need to write unto them because it doesn't concern us. The times and seasons of prophecy are not about the body of Christ. They're about the nation Israel and the Gentile nations. And he said this, You have no need that I write unto you for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now a lot of times people talk about the rapture of the church being a thief in the night because it's going to happen su suddenly and unexpectedly. But there are various references to this thief in the night and every time in the context he's talking about the uh, second coming of Christ. Okay, it's going to be sudden and unexpected on the unbelieving world. There will be a godly remnant looking and watching and waiting. And I think that the godly Jews in the tribulation can have an idea of when it's close. They won't know the exact day or hour, Christ said. Uh, but the world that scoffs God and rejects God and doesn't believe the word of God, it's just like it was in the days of Noah. I mean, they didn't believe that flood was coming, but it came like a thief in the night. They should have known. They could have known. Noah warned them. And that's how it's going to be with the second coming. It's going to come unexpectedly on this world. Notice what he said in verse 3, For when they shall say. So notice at the end of chapter 4 about our rapture, it's we. But then you come into chapter 5 and he's talking about what comes after our rapture. Getting into the uh, 70th week of Daniel and the second coming. And he said, when they. Now we're going to be gone, okay, <laughs> when this takes place. When they shall say, peace and safety. And that's the first part of the 70th week. The Antichrist comes in with flatteries. He comes in with false peace. He makes a covenant with Israel. A seven-year peace covenant. But he's going to break it in the midst. And he's, the great peacemaker is going to become the great persecutor as he tries to annihilate the nation Israel. Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Not us, them. As travail upon a woman with child... And they shall not escape. All right, so this sudden destruction, it comes, and notice, sudden, like a thief in the night. Sudden destruction cometh upon them. But when you study prophecy about this travail, travail upon a woman with child, there's a, there's a, that shows up a number of times in prophecy. And what you need to understand about it is the travail... There's a beginning of sorrows, but it gets, it intensifies. It gets stronger, it gets more difficult till the woman's finally delivered. And so uh, Jesus Christ taught in Matthew 24 about the 70th week of Daniel. And he mentioned the beginning of sorrows, how this thing is going to start out. And then he used the, the words great tribulation. And then he said after the tribulation. So the, he outlines the beginning and then the midst when the abomination of desolation is there in the temple. The Antichrist saying he's God demanding to be worshipped. That's That marks then the great tribulation. The, the first three and a half years, the last three and a half years, when you study prophecy about the 70th week, that seven year period is given in terms of months and days, uh, 42 months, 1260 days, I believe it is. But it, it shows, it puts it in half. And what happens in the midst 
is that there's a battle in heaven and Satan and his angels are cast down and Satan fills the Antichrist and that man of sin becomes the son of perdition. Um, he's filled with Satan and you have that great tribulation and then Christ comes after the tribulation at the end there. And so what you'll find is you'll find an outline, an overview of this period in Matthew 24 and Revelation 6. So we know by Daniel 9, there is a final week that has not been fulfilled. A seven-year period, a week of years. And we can learn some things about that in Daniel 9. But then when you take Matthew 24 and Revelation 6, you get a sweeping overview of the thing. And it's very instructive to see all of that. But look back in uh, Isaiah 13. And keep a marker in 1 Thessalonians 5 because we'll be back. But Isaiah 13... Uh, concerning the day of the Lord. We looked at this passage last time. I won't read the whole passage, but I want to point something out again. Isaiah 13, verse number 6. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. And they shall be afraid, pangs and sorrows. You know what that word sorrows? Christ said the beginning of sorrows. Sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. Now look over in Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66. And of course there's that prophecy while you're finding Isaiah 66. I remind you that in Jeremiah 30 you have that phrase, the time of Jacob's trouble. He's talking about the day of the Lord. And, he, and again, he says, it's like a woman in travail. Okay, the time of Jacob's trouble, Israel. It's got nothing to do with the body of Christ. This is what's determined upon Israel and the nations. Now, Isaiah 66, verse 7 and 8. Before she travailed, that would be Israel, she brought forth, before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? And there's going to come a point in which the nation Israel is born again. They were born of God under the old covenant, brought out of Egypt, out in the wilderness, put under the old covenant. God said, this is my firstborn. But then through the prophet Hosea, he said, you're not my people. Okay, they, they had failed under that old covenant. But he's going to put them under a new covenant. And under that new covenant, they are born again as a nation. So that nation will be born at once at the second coming. For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. So there's something here about a woman that's going to have a child. She has a man child before she goes into that great travail of the great tribulation. I mean, the sorrow is there, but it gets a whole lot worse in the last part of the 70th week. And keep that in mind, because we'll come back to that, who this man-child is over in the book of Revelation. I think we can, we can understand that and see that. Now, this is very important. Uh, this whole period is going to come as a result of the wrath of God. Now, the wrath of God, I mean, it's being held back right now, but it will come. And when this age ends, it will begin, but it comes gradually. He doesn't pour it all out at once. Okay, It's going to build more and more and more until it's poured out at the end of the 70th week. But the fact there is a 70th week, the fact that there is an Antichrist, the fact that these things are all going to happen is a result of the wrath of God. Um, very different from this age of His amazing long-suffering and grace. And of course, He always has long-suffering and grace. But there's something about this age that's so distinct as compared to what's coming in the future. And so, those who believe in a mid-trib rapture of the church or what they call a pre-wrath rapture, there's various views on when the rapture of the body of Christ will take place. A lot of people don't understand that there actually is more than one rapture to come. Being people caught up off the earth, the body of Christ will be caught up before the 70th week begins. 
But then there's going to be a, a rapture of a group in the middle of the 70th week. Then there's another rapture at the end of the 70th week. So the fact is there is a pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib raptures. But they're different groups. But people won't rightly divide the word of truth. That's why they get these things so confused. Now here's the thing. The people want to say, well, the wrath of God does not come until the end of the Great Tribulation. They say everything going on in the Tribulation has got to do with Satan and the Antichrist and so on. And God doesn't really have wrath until the end. And the reason why they say that is because whenever Paul says we've been delivered from the wrath to come, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, when he said we've not been appointed to wrath, 1 Thessalonians 5.9, they say, well, he's, he's not teaching that the body of Christ will not go through the tribulation. They say, we're going through it, but we get caught up right before God pours out his wrath. And they say, he doesn't pour it out to the end. You understand? I should have brought the board over here, but it's all right. You can look over there. You can see it in the corner. It's kind of, you see the timeline, basic timeline there. Um, but you're familiar with these things. I'm just trying to review a little bit. I want to go further in this. Um, the, the fact is, the church, the body of Christ, is not going through any, any of the seven-year period preceding the second coming of Christ. And the reason why I know that is a number of things. Ob an obvious one is that whole period, all seven years, is the subject of much prophecy. But we are a mystery, unknown to the prophets. And when we rightly divide prophecy concerning Israel from the mystery of the body of Christ then we're not going to put the body of Christ in that time of prophecy concerning Israel and the nations. After all, it's a different gospel being preached. After all, it's a different dispensation in many ways. We are ambassadors for Christ with a message of great peace and reconciliation, but before war is declared, ambassadors are called home. And God's going to call us home, then declare war on this world, and things change in a great way. And so we understand the church, the body of Christ, was a great mystery revealed to Paul. Well, so was our rapture. That's why he said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. And 1 Thessalonians 4, he said, this we say to you by the word of the Lord. He's giving new revelation. It's not something found in prophecy. I guarantee you this. If you'll acknowledge that the blessed hope of the body of Christ was was a mystery revealed to Paul, and you only find it in his epistles, you won't wind up believing in a mid-trib or post-trib or pre-wrath or any of this other stuff. You'll understand we're getting out of here before the 70th week. In fact, we are what's keeping the 70th week from coming. That can't come till we're gone. We're holding that back. Can't mix these things. And so Paul again and again is exhorting the body of Christ to look for Christ from heaven, to wait for Christ from heaven, he doesn't instruct us how to deal with the tribulation period. He doesn't instruct us on, on how to overcome the beast and so forth because that does not concern us. The times and the seasons of prophecy, Paul said, I have no need to write unto you about these matters. Back in 1 Thessalonians, look in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 4. But ye, brethren, so in contrast now, he's talking about they and them in the world and what's coming. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness. That 70th week is a period of darkness, but we're not appointed to that. We're children of light. You're not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. It has nothing to do with us. We're not looking for that day. What are we looking for? Read on. You're all children of light and the children of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. What are we watching for? What are we to be sober about? Well, let's read on. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Our spiritual armor. And by the way, believing sound doctrine ought to impact how we live our lives. He's saying if, you're, if you are in the light, then act like a child of light. Live like a child of light. Don't be walking around sleeping in drunkenness. That's of the flesh. That's of the darkness. No, you need to act like, you need to be serious about serving God. And this hope of salvation has to do with the knowledge 
of Christ coming for us to catch us away at any moment. He said in verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. The wrath that's coming on this world, we're not appointed to that. What are we appointed to? We're going to be saved from it. We're saved from the wrath to come. That salvation is our rapture. We're getting out of here before all that comes. He said, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. You know, we need to watch and be sober, but the sad reality is there's a lot of believers that are not watching and they're not sober about this. But regardless, we're all going up when the Lord comes. There are people teaching a split rapture. They say only the spiritual are going up and the rest have to go through tribulation to be chastened. But that's, as I've often said, that's not a rapture, that's a rupture. We're one body of Christ getting caught up together. The dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the, uh, in, the, in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. It's going to be a gathering together of the whole body. And it's going to happen whether we wake or sleep. But we need to wake up to it. I mean, we're closer now than ever. I mean, it, it could be today. And a lot of people, man, they just live for this world. They love this world instead of loving is appearing. I'm looking for that blessed hope. I'm not looking for a lot of stuff this world's looking for. They're looking for answers in all the wrong places. Christ is still the answer, and He's coming to get us out of here. And He said this, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. What a comfort it is to know that... And look, we have tribulation. I understand that. But there's a difference between tribulation... And how we serve God and we're persecuted and opposed and the things we go through in this world and the prophesied time that's coming, that's something else. And it's a comfort to know that before God pours out His wrath on this world, He's getting us out of here and we're going to be glorified with Him and reign with Him in His heavenly kingdom. What a great comfort that is. Look in 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians 2. So in 1 Thessalonians, Paul emphasizes the coming of the Lord for the church. But in 2 Thessalonians, he's emphasizing the second coming of Christ. And the reason is false teachers had come in the church at Thessalonica were troubling them saying, Oh, you're going through the tribulation. That's why you're suffering like you are. And uh, maybe they missed the rapture or Paul wasn't right in what he taught them. And they were troubled. They were shaken in mind. So he's correcting. The whole reason he wrote 2 Thessalonians is to correct the false doctrine that the church is going through the tribulation period. And yet, you, what do you have? You have men today who teach the church is going through the tribulation period. And one of the main places they go to is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Which is refuting what they're saying. But they don't get the context. They don't understand what's going on here. Look at it. Verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. Now that's our blessed hope. Paul's beseeching the church by this truth, not to get messed up with wrong doctrine. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. And that's what false doctrine will do. Neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us. And, and these, these seducing spirits and this, um, you know, what Satan will use is he'll use men that are deceived by seducing spirits and they give their own word instead of the word of God and they use counterfeit scripture. <laughs> Paul said it, it has a letter as from us. He didn't write it. There's counterfeit scripture today. There's whole Bibles that are called Bibles that are counterfeits. They've been corrupted. They have false doctrine in them. Satan's a deceiver. He says that, that as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, the day of Christ in this context is the second coming of Christ. Now, sometimes Paul will refer to the day of Christ as in our rapture and the judgment seat of Christ. I understand that. But you know what? The context determines how it's used. We talk about the day of the Lord. Well, Christ is the Lord. So you can refer to the day of the Lord as the day of Christ. That's fine. And I'm not, I'm not saying we should change this. Schofield's note says this should say the day of the Lord. I like that it says the day of Christ because Christ is the Lord. I wouldn't change anything in the Bible. All you got to do is look at the context. He can't be talking about the rapture because it wouldn't make sense for him to say, I'm beseeching you, 
by our rapture, not to be troubled that our rapture is at hand. That makes no sense. Paul taught in Philippians 4 and Romans 13 that the coming of the Lord for us is at hand. That means it's near, it's imminent. What does he tell them here? The day of Christ is not at hand. Well, that has to be the second coming. And you want to know why the second coming is not at hand? Because certain things have to be fulfilled first. There are many signs pointing to it. There are no signs for our rapture. We're looking for Christ every day. We don't look. I don't look for the rapture on the basis of current events. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on in this world that makes me think, man, something big's about to happen. And I think the Lord's coming. But I think it'd be, it might be one of them days where everything's mundane, nothing big's going on, uh, on at all, and all of a sudden, we're gone. I mean, it's just going to happen. And we ought to look for it every day. I, I saw there's a guy, King James Bible believer. I don't know much about him, but he put out, and I didn't watch it. I, I, could, I started to, but I was like, eh. But he, he was talking about the rapture's coming in 2033. I was like, I don't want to wait 13 years. How discouraging is that, right? Now, look, I enjoy life, and I, I'm very blessed in this life with my family and church family. And I, and, but, but look, when the Lord comes, it's going to get better. It's not going to get worse. And, and we love His appearing, and we're looking for His appearing. But at any rate, He said that the day of Christ is at hand. You said, no, you're not in the tribulation. That's what He's telling them. If, if the day of Christ, as in the second coming, was at hand, that would mean they're in that final period leading up to it, and they're troubled by that. And, and they, because Paul told them they're not appointed of that. So what happened, right? So he's straightening it out. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall uh, not, not come except there come a falling away first. Now see, this is what they do. They say the day of Christ here in verse 2 is the rapture. And they say the rapture can't happen until the Antichrist shows up. But the day of Christ is not the rapture. It's the second coming. If you, if you understand what he's talking about, it, it all fits and makes sense. You see what I'm saying, how they handle that? If the day of Christ is our rapture in verse 2, that would mean it cannot come, because he's fixing to talk about the, the Antichrist showing up. It would mean we, we, we get caught up after the Antichrist shows up. No, we get caught up before he shows up. In fact, we are what's keeping him from showing up. Read on. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. One world religion is coming. And by the way, there's no temple over there. Now, <clears throat> the temple could be built pretty quick nowadays, couldn't it? Uh, and I know they're trying to do that, and they want to do that. But, you know, there's also an issue of the tabernacle is called a temple sometimes in Scripture, and they could be raising up the tabernacle of David. There's a prophecy about that in Amos. So uh, there's no temple over there right now, though, but it can get put up pretty quick. But he's going to sit in that temple showing that he is God. Remember, And so don't say, well, we, the, the, we have to look for the temple to be rebuilt before we know the Lord's coming. No, because the, there, there may be a gap of time between the coming of the Lord and the beginning of the 70th week. And furthermore, a temple could be erected within the first three and a half years of the 70th week anyway. Okay, but nonetheless. He said, uh, verse 5, Remember you not that uh, when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Okay, you know, they had gotten off track because they were listening to false teachers contradicting what he already told them. We better listen to Paul or we're going to get messed up in our doctrine. Okay, Paul writes to us. We believe the whole Bible, we study the whole Bible, but if we're going to understand the issue of the rapture, you better get it from Paul. He's the one that received that information of the Lord. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. What is withholding? The Antichrist from being revealed. It's this present mystery age that interrupted the 490 years prophecy. 70 weeks of years, 483 have been fulfilled, 7 are yet to be fulfilled. We are withholding that from being fulfilled. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and boy does it ever. Only he, the, uh, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Who is the he? That would be the church, the body of Christ. we got to be taken out of the way before this stuff can come. Do you want to know why Paul's outlining the 70th week? And he gives an overview of the 70th week here about the Antichrist, how he starts as the man of sin, he becomes the son of perdition, and how this thing's going to unfold. 
He's showing them this to, to let them know you aren't seeing it. So you're not in the 70th week and you won't be. That's the whole point. And then, verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, because they first rejected God's truth, God shall send them strong delusion. The fact that Antichrist can show up and deceive the world is because of the judgment of God and the wrath of God. He's going to, it's God that sends him this strong delusion. This is what the world wanted. That they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned. Boy, that sounds like wrath, doesn't it? That sounds like judgment, and it is. Who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's what's going to happen. But, notice the contrast. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. That salvation is talking about our rapture. Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. When you believe the gospel, you're baptized by one Spirit and one body. Now you're a part of a group that's going to be out of here before this comes. We're saved from all of this. Where until you called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how I know he's talking about our rapture. He's talking about our glorification. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Paul received our hope and delivered it to us to keep. I didn't get the rapture doctrine from Darby or Schofield. I got it from the Apostle Paul who got it from the Lord. Do you understand? We need to hold fast to it. We need to stand fast with it. Now notice what he said. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. What a contrast. The chapter opened with them being troubled and shaken in mind, but now that he's corrected the bad doctrine and shown them that we're getting out of here before the Antichrist shows up, that we ought to have a heart that's comforted and we ought to be established in every good word and work. False doctrine will trouble you and shake you up in your mind. Sound doctrine will comfort your heart and establish you. You see the difference? And by the way, look in chapter 3, verse number 4. Or excuse me, verse 3. But the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Well, this is a church under heavy persecution. Evil men are persecuting them. So what does he mean by that? In the context, he's reminding them God is faithful. He's going to keep you from the evil of the Antichrist. You're not going to face him. You're getting out of here. That's the whole point of what he's saying. Now, we are saved from the wrath to come. And all seven years of the, of the tribulation is a result of the wrath of God concerning Israel, concerning the world. And um, in Revelation 6, don't turn there, uh, but I remind you that there are six seals that are opened and what it does, when you compare Revelation 6 with Matthew 24, it's the same outline. False Christs, then wars, then famine, then pestilence and beasts, then martyrs, then signs in the heavens. That's in my book, that, out, that chart's in the book. If you can check that out and study that, I show you, I show you the overview. That's the beginning of sorrows. That's the great tribulation. That's after the tribulation. All of that. So you know what happens in the... Look in Revelation 12, and this is where I'm trying to get, and i got five minutes to deal with it now. How about that? It took me 35 minutes to get to a point where I can talk to you for five minutes about something. <laughs> it's Christ who opens the seals. Christ sends the Antichrist. The Antichrist is Satan's Christ, but he can't come on the scene unless God lets it happen. It's God's judgment. He said, you didn't want my truth. I offered you truth for all these years. And you kept rejecting it. And you kept, all right, here's your lie. That's what you want. He sends them strong delusion. And I believe that people who reject the gospel, the grace of God in this age, when the Lord comes and they're left behind, they're going to believe the lie and be damned. If they wouldn't trust the gospel, the grace of God, you think they're going to endure to the end? You think they're going to reject the beast? Do you realize how ripe and ready this world is right now for the Antichrist? Do you realize how easy he's going to have? I mean, people, skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for his life. That's what Satan said. He's right about, he was wrong about Job, but he's right about most everybody else. 
When that Antichrist said, you, want, you, want the mark, you don't want to take the mark, okay, you can't go to the store. You can't buy, you can't sell, you can't go to your doctor. You, you, you got you to gotta have this mark to do anything. People are going to take it just like that. And we're, we're seeing with what's going on right now in current events how conditioned the world is for that moment. People, if it, if they, they care more about their health than anything else, it seems. That's very carnal. We ought to be thinking about the things of God and what glorifies God, and we ought to be thinking about truth. And there are people right now... Anyway. Hey, this is a cakewalk right now, buddy. You see how the world's acting about this virus? Wait till the tribulation hits. They, and they're going to they're gonna reject the beast, are they? Uh, they're proving how weak they are, aren't they? How weak-minded. And how much they love their own carcass more than anything. Well, there's a lot to consider there. But in Revelation 12... Um, Verse 17, the dragon was wroth with the woman, that's Israel, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what people say is, the, the great tribulation is Satan's wrath. Wait a minute. Why is Satan able to come down to this earth and do this? Look back in chapter 12 and verse number... Oh, verse 1. <laughs> there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. That's Israel. The moon. The, the moon. I, I don't have time to expound all this. I can prove all this by cross-references, but this woman is certainly Israel. The woman under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and he cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. A lot of people assume this is talking about Jesus Christ when he was born, but this is a prophecy. And yes, Christ is going to rule with a rod of iron, but in Revelation, it also, in chapter 2, I believe it is, it talks about the remnant who's going to rule with him with a rod of iron. So what this is, the man-child goes back to Isaiah 66. In Revelation 7, there's 144,000 of the 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. They'll, they are sealed at the beginning of the tribulation. Next time you see them, they're all with Christ in heaven in Revelation 14. How does 144,000 make it to heaven at the same time? They're caught up right here in Revelation 12. The 144,000 is the first fruits of the nation that will be born at the second coming. So they are God's servants and they preach the gospel of the kingdom in all the world in the first three and a half years. Then they're caught up to escape the great tribulation. They're, they're the man child and you can bear that out. And I did a video on this uh, not long ago on our Q&A series. But this, um, this man child, I believe, represents the 144,000. They're caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath the place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. So but we know they're caught up in the midst of the 70th week because after they're caught up, the, Israel has to flee out in the wilderness for that last three and a half years. And there was war in heaven. Notice this now. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I, and I heard of a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. They are willing to be martyrs. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And for the, of the sea, for the devils come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. That lasts three and a half years. So here's the thing. Christ begins his warfare in heaven before he makes it down to the earth. 
You want to know why Satan's cast down to the earth? Because God kicks him out. And he sends Michael and his angels to cast Satan. Satan and his, Satan's the prince of power of the air. I don't believe he's in the third heaven, but he's in that second heaven, and he has a place there, and he's coming down to this earth. And he's going to fill the, the Antichrist. Look, please, real quick, one more place in Isaiah 24. Let me show you this. Isaiah 24, and we'll wrap this up. I'm trying to go somewhere with all of this. You see, when the Lord is... It's the day of the Lord's all about Him taking over and taking over the kingdoms. Now, uh, he's, called, he's the Most High, and according to Genesis 14, the Most High means He's the possessor of heaven and earth. And that's why Christ said before He ascended back to heaven in Matthew 28, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. And we know that God has a plan for the heaven and the earth. That's why the first verse of the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. But we understand God kept His purpose for the heaven a secret, didn't He? That's the body of Christ, right? The great mystery. Had the princes of this world known it, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. Satan was so fixed on this earth and having his kingdom on this earth and keeping God from putting his kingdom on this earth, he was so fixed on that that when he had Christ crucified, he thought he was defeating God's purpose in establishing his kingdom on the earth. After all, Israel killed their king. But he had a secret purpose accomplished through that very death, burial, and resurrection by which he would build a new entity, a new creature, the body of Christ, that he was going to give the heavenly places. So Satan lost his dominion on, in heaven and earth. What I'm saying is, and that's why Satan hates the mystery so badly. Obviously, it's the truth of God, but it made a fool out of him. He tricked himself. He fooled himself. And he, in other words, we, the body of Christ, when Satan and his angels are cast out, they lose their place. Paul said in Colossians 1.16, there are thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. He said both visible and invisible, heaven and earth. There's governmental structures in the heavens that, just like there is on the earth. We're never told anything about reigning on the earth, but we are given a place in heaven. And I believe we'll reign with Christ in heaven. And there's a lot to all of that. But when the day of the Lord comes... He's going to start that warfare in heaven and then bring it to the earth. Satan and his angels are cast out of heaven. There's a war where? Revelation 12, the war was where? Heaven in the middle of the week. Okay, you got that? And when Satan's cast out of heaven, that's when he fills the Antichrist and that's when you have the last three and a half years. But in Isaiah 24... This is a lot of stuff to get into. I'm not even scratching the surface. I told you the Bible has a lot on this. Isaiah 24, um, look at verse 20, excuse me, 21. It shall come to pass in that day, that's the day of the Lord, that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high. That's in heaven. And then the kings of the earth. First, He's going to punish the host of the high ones. Then He's coming to get the kings of the earth uh, upon the earth, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in the prison. After many days shall they be visited, and the moon then the moon shall be confounded, and the sun is shamed. When the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion in Jerusalem before his ancients gloriously. Chapter 34. Isaiah 34 is another one. Uh, there's more, but I'll just give you this one since it's so close. Isaiah 34. Oh, man. Let's see. Jump in here at verse number... I'm, I'm in chapter 33. That's why I don't look right. Verse number uh, 34, verse 4. The, all, all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth from off the vine, as a falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Iduma and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood and so forth. The time of judgment, the time of his wrath. But notice where it starts, the host of heaven. Where does it start? My sword shall be bathed where? In heaven. Now all that to say this. We, <clears throat> that battle takes place in the middle of the 70th week. Correct? So, what's going to happen is the body of Christ is caught up before the 70th week. We go through the judgment seat of Christ and that's where we're fitted 
to find out where we're going to reign in the heavenly kingdom. We get rewards determining how we're going to reign, to what extent we're going to reign. So we've got to be glorified and judged and ready to take those places when they're vacant in the 70th week, which necessitates that we get out of here before the 70th week. Do you understand that? We can't go through the tribulation for this to work. And you have to understand that it starts in heaven. Then comes to the earth. There's a judgment seat of Christ because we're getting ready to reign in heaven. Then He's going to bring His kingdom to the earth. He's going to set us in our positions so that when He comes to the earth, there is a manifestation of the sons of God according to Romans 8. The world's going to know about the body of Christ when Christ comes. A lot of people act like we're going to have nothing to do with that. I guarantee you we're going to have something to do with that because we're going to judge the world. We're not, we have a position higher than the earth, but there's going to be a glorification and a manifestation and an appearance. So all of this, you have to see the timing of it that the body of Christ gets caught up first. Then there's that final period. And, like I, to, and I wish I had time to develop this, but I don't. Uh, I mentioned this last time. When John got the book of Revelation, he said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And he writes about the 70th week, the second coming, and the millennial reign, and all of that. That's the day of the Lord. It comes. At, it, what's going to trigger it is we get caught up, and then that thing begins to happen, and it starts in heaven, and it comes to the earth. And boy, there's, we didn't even scratch the surface, but there's something to think about. <laughs> Study it further. Father, thank you for the time.